Thank you all for joining us. This is um, a super exciting panel that we are about to experience um, all around climate change, food insecurity, water insecurity. I am Heather Godsmark. I have the uh, privilege of serving as the Fulbright Association Board Secretary. I was a Fulbrighter in 2000, 2001 to Germany where I studied finance in Frankfurt. Um, and I have been trying to pay that forward ever since. Um, and so one way that I'm doing that is through service to the Fulbright Association and talking as much as possible about Fulbright and the wonderful work um, that the program does. Um, in addition to my Fulbright role, my day job, I help um, renewables developers and private equity um, buy into infrastructure projects. And so this is kind of my sweet spot. Over the years, I have been a consultant in climate change and sustainability and just really um, have a passion for this topic. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited for our panelists today. There is a lot to be challenged with that's, that's going on today. There, it's really, you can, you can get depressed quite easily reading the news. But the exciting thing is, we are here today with four individuals who are working day in and day out to really make the world a better place. And so what I'm excited for, we are all here as part of the Fulbright mission to make the world a better place through international understanding. But we can't forget our local um, our local issues and our local communities as well. And so we touch local, state, federal, and international here today. Um, and so without further ado, I want to kind of get into the, in, into the meat of our topics today. We're going to have um, brief remarks from each of our panelists. We're then going to have a chat amongst ourselves. Um, and then we're going to open it for questions um, from everybody here. So thank you. Um, first up is Councillor Clinton White from the USAID. He has um, more than 20 years of experience in the public sector uh, and is a member of the Senior Foreign Service. Um, prior to this assignment that he's on now, he was the regional representative in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean, and he's served in Libya, Egypt, Pakistan, Senegal, and Ghana. Um, he is, he is leading the agency, uh, and he, he inspires everyone for purpose-driven engagement to tackle some of the world's most vexing development and humanitarian challenges. So please welcome Councillor White. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, and thank you all for being here. Good morning. Good morning? Oh, okay, just mic check, okay, thank you. No, it's a great pleasure to be here and join uh, you for this event today on behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, which we call USAID. I'm also delighted to be here in the state of Colorado and the city of Denver. Actually, as I was mentioning to um, the panelists up here, the distinguished panelists up here, this is my first time coming here, but I actually do plan on coming back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I see the warm welcome I'm getting. I love that. I love the energy. Um, but actually, no, it's so important to be able to have these discussions, like the one that we're having on environment, climate change, food and water security. These are the type of challenges that USAID is working on to solve globally um, on behalf of the United States. But also on a personal level, coming here has allowed me to also reconnect with one of my childhood friends, Joshua Hanfling, and his parents, Phyllis and Bob Hanfling, who live here now, but we all grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. And at that particular time, our parents were very active in the civil rights movement, fighting for equality so that everyone could have the same access to jobs and the basic services that we all seek around food and water security. These are the same areas that these and other distinguished panelists are all seeking in their work. And I'm honored and humbled, actually, to truly be on the stage to discuss how we are solving these global challenges. Because all of us are dedicated to turning conversations and ideas into meaningful actions. 
Now we know that more than two billion people still live without access to safe water and four billion people live without safe sanitation. Water stress is increasingly affecting the world's most marginalized people, particularly women. Disasters, including those exacerbated by climate change, are overwhelming, overwhelmingly water-related and are becoming more frequent and intense, and in turn, pushing people into a vicious cycle of poverty, food insecurity, and vulnerability. We also know that the state of Colorado is also investing, investing in, in tackling the water future. When we speak about water, I think the person who taught me most about the importance of water was my great aunt Rose. She was my grandmother, uh, sister, and her brothers and sisters grew up in a small rectangular house in the Jim Crow South. When I was living in Florida during my college years, I often visited great aunt Rose, uh, who still lived in Macon, Georgia, in that same house that she grew up in. And that house had only one water source, which was a well in the backyard. Now, this was an old well that was dug by past generations of my ancestors. This cool, sweet well water was anywhere between 30 to 80 feet deep and passed through a layer of gravel, red clay, limestone, and sandstone. Moreover, this well water was trapped below the ground in the pores and spaces above the dense rock barrier, which is also called groundwater. Now, Aunt Rose was in her 80s and thought, you know, she might have looked a little frail, but she was as strong as anyone and not afraid of anyone. I can remember one morning waking up and watching her draw the water from the well, bringing up the heavy metal chain and a metal bucket from the mouth of the well. She saw me and waved me over for a cool drink. Sometimes she would say this water was so good, it was healing. So after that, my cousins and I only wanted to drink well water. But we also kind of joked about it because we, you know, we saw her drawing up the water and then until we tried it. And I, that actually was a very humbling experience. And also let me know just how strong my Aunt Rose really was. Because my cousins and I, we struggled bringing the well water up. But she lifted it, bucket up effortlessly. So I guess that well water gave her superpowers, but she also taught me just how vital water is for our lives and livelihoods. Now I'm going to speak just a little bit and I'll get off stage and, and move on, but I did want to mention that in 2021, the U.S. government launched, launched its updated global food security strategy, an integrated whole of government approach that aims to end global hunger, poverty, and malnutrition through the Feed the Future initiative. And last year, Vice President Kamala Harris also launched the U.S. government's first ever White House action plan on global water security to elevate water as a national security and foreign policy priority. The U.S. government's global and water and food security strategies are complemented by USAID's climate strategy, a whole of agency approach that guides our response to the climate crisis, which is worsening water and food security all around the world. We are also scaling up comprehensive approaches to fighting hunger and strengthening our food security in many ways by ensuring that we are under our Feed the Future program, that we're working in more than 40 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean to help them and alleviate poverty and hunger. I also want to mention about a little bit about adaptation and resilience, where in November, again, 2021, President Biden launched his emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, which we call PREPARE, to unite the diplomatic development and technical expertise of the United States with a, with a goal of helping more than half a billion people in climate vulnerable developing countries. But when we speak about all of this, we cannot forget climate equity. We need to recognize that in working to address food and water security related challenges, including those exasperated by climate impacts, we are also supporting gender equality, poverty reduction, climate justice, healthier populations, and education for all. In many cases, women, youth, indigenous peoples, and other populations who are marginalized bear the brunt of climate impact. So we have to commit ourselves to ensuring that everyone is represented at the table and that all of our work is improving the lives of everyone that we're working with, both here and overseas. Now I am going to bring it a little bit closer to home, if I could just spare two more minutes. Because what's also important is to understand what USAID is doing globally, but why does that really matter here in the United States? 
which is a lot of questions that we get from, from our taxpayers who you know, pay for USAID. But also, more specifically, I want to delve a little bit into how the state of Colorado is bringing solutions to the problems, not only here, but globally. So this past year, USAID, through our contracts and grants, um, have provided over $34 million that this state of Colorado is contributing uh, to your economy. I think that's good news. And when it comes to food security and agriculture, we are partnering with four Colorado farmers, but moreover, under one of our largest programs, which I mentioned earlier called Feed the Future, we are partnering with local universities. We're providing funding to two Colorado universities, Colorado State University and the University of Colorado Boulder on life-saving initiatives around the world. One of those being what we call an innovation lab for nutrition, where we're promoting food systems innovations, novel technologies, and best practices to support improved diet quality, nutrition, and resilience. Then Colorado State University is also part of our crop improvement lab, whose goal is to partner with scientists and stakeholders around the world to co-develop tools and technologies and methods in crop improvement. So for example, in one country, in Africa, cowpea is a staple food that was originally domesticated on the continent. The legume offers from, from, uh, families a vital source of protein, fiber, and potassium. With the climate change driving more frequent droughts, this Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement is now working through a partnership with research institutions in Malawi, Mozambique, and Tanzania to develop climate resilient cowpeas so that the small holder farmers can continue to grow this staple, which is so important when we talk about localization or working directly with the beneficiaries. But these are just some of the things that Colorado is actually doing in working with USAID and helping not only the world globally, but also here. So finally, I just want to say, again, thank you for the warm welcome. And also just when I think about what we do, none of us is winning in this game until all of us are winning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor White. Um, I would then like to ask Aaron Pulling to um, step to the podium. Aaron has served as the CEO of the Food Bank of the Rockies since January 2019. Food Bank of the Rockies ignites the power of community to nourish people facing hunger, distributing enough food every day for more than 180,000 meals. With a staff of 250, a volunteer base of 18,000, and four distribution centers, Food Bank of the Rockies serves 32 counties, Colorado counties, and all of Wyoming. So thank you, Aaron, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so great to see you all today. How many of you are familiar? Have you heard of Feeding America? Have like a working definition? A lot of you. So Food Bank of the Rockies is the local Feeding America food bank. We actually cover a bigger geographic footprint than any of the other Feeding America food banks in the contiguous U.S. Only Alaska covers a bigger territory. And you know, I started at Food Bank of the Rockies almost five years ago. I'd been at my previous organization 24 years, and when I went, came to this interview, I said the three words that I knew that I thought would disqualify me. So I'm like, I can't afford to have this taking up my brain space. I loved my job that I was in, but it had been a long time. Those words were nutrition, advocacy, and equity. Things that the food banking movement was not known for and the Food Bank of the Rockies wasn't known for. And I thought they would, you know, the board of directors would say, thanks, Missy, and you're not the right fit right now. Little did I know, a board member slammed his hands on the table and said, we are so ready for this. That really birthed, I mean, and what, the movement that's been happening locally and that Feeding America is working on nationally and really changing our food banking practices. And it was really just in time. I mean, COVID hit one year after I was on staff. So the challenge and the stress of operating a frontline workforce with record increases in need and supply chain disruptions, we thought were the perfect storm, a level of challenges that we would never see again. Little did we know what we faced in the last few years, now a couple years, have really even been more, more challenges than that. With 
at the beginning of COVID, SNAP emergency allotments, SNAP is food stamp, so food stamp emergency allotments were put in place, which is a really nice increase, a boost for people receiving SNAP. Those were eliminated just a few months ago, and that average decrease is $90 per person per month. So a household of four, that's a $360 decrease in their monthly SNAP or food stamp allotments. At the same time, we're faced with food price increases that we've all, we've all had that sticker shock at the grocery store, right? And so more, you can understand that more people are needing help than ever before. But while we're seeing that increase in help, Food Bank of the Rockies, like all Feeding America food banks across the country, are grappling with our own cost increases. Just for instance, cucumbers. We buy a lot of cucumbers over the course of a year, 11 truckloads. Just for cucumbers, we're paying $40,000 more per year for cucumbers than we were a year ago. Onions, $35,000 more per year. We buy 20 truckloads of onions over the course of a year. And the fact, the biggest factor is that USDA or government commodity food has really decreased. In the height of COVID, it was half of our food supply. It's now 13%. So while facing this increase, we are purchasing more food than ever. For us at Food Bank of the Rockies, that totals one and a half million dollars a month that we're spending on food right now in comparison to a few hundred thousand dollars a month pre-COVID. So, you know, what's the answer and where does this fit? I mean, it's so multifaceted and that's why I'm so honored to present alongside with Senator Bennett today, who is such a champion for our work and for the Farm Bill, which is essential for our work. That's brings in the USDA or government commodity food that we receive. Because while we've been grappling to meet this increased need, we're also disrupting previous food bank practices. We no longer believe in just the model of getting that food that was getting thrown in the dumpster at the area neighborhood grocery store to the food pantry down the street. That's the, what, what birthed our movement. We do that, that's about half of our food supply that comes from our grocery, other retail and manufacturer partners, all that donated food. But we also believe in quality of food, culturally responsive food, as much local sourcing as possible. So we've launched initiatives around all of those so that we're providing food that is both familiar and appropriate and important to meet the nutrition and health needs of those we serve. And we're working to be more and more what we call neighbor-centric, that's client-centric. Instead of doing for, it's a doing with. So it has been a privilege to be part of this disrupting movement. It, the challenges that lie ahead are tremendously, because we don't see an end in sight to this increased need that we're seeing and increased food purchasing. And it's truly been made possible by the outpouring of support from individuals, both financially and through volunteers. So thank you for those of you who are involved with your local Feeding America Food Bank or with Food Bank of the Rockies. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, next, we have Senator Michael Bennett, who has represented Colorado in the United States Senate since 2009. He is widely recognized as a pragmatic and independent thinker driven by a deep-seated obligation to create more opportunity for the next generation. He's built a reputation of taking on Washington dysfunction and working with Republicans and Democrats to address our nation's greatest challenges. But really, his most important title is father of a Fulbrighter. <laughs> his daughter is currently a Fulbrighter in Delhi. It's wonderful to have all of you here. I want to uh, say thank you to Fulbright for uh, seeing the merits of my daughter. She's having an amazing time in New Delhi, which is where she's spending the year, having graduated from college last year. And, uh, and I want to thank all of you for being here. I gather, uh, I'd heard on the way in that you often have your, con your annual conference in Washington or near Washington, D.C. Look at the charms of Denver, Colorado, and the charms, <laughs> the, char the charms of the American West, and we'll take you anytime you want to come. Um, this weather that you're seeing is not the consequence of global warming. 
this is just what it's like to be in Denver, Colorado on, <laughs> in the middle of October. Not a bad place to be. You're living in a, you're, you're sitting in a place that is, uh, was the basically the, uh, the, almost where Denver started. Denver started just a few blocks from here. It was the confluence of two bodies of water, uh, uh, the South Platte and, and Cherry Creek Reservoir. And all of our history, basically, since that time until now, uh, there was a long time of thousands and thousands and thousands of years when indigenous people lived here and lived here in this desert in a way that was completely sustainable as far as anybody now knows and was at the time uh, that Denver was founded. We've had many challenges since Denver was founded dealing with the fact that we are living in the desert. This is an arid place that doesn't get a lot of rain and we have had enormous conflict over the years and some years of getting together as different interests have competed for the same very scarce water. If you look at the mountains, you'll see the, the Continental Divide is right outside here, and that is really the beginning of what is called the Western Slope in Colorado, which is where most of the water is and where most of many, much of the agricultural inter interests were, certainly at the origins of, of when our state started. But a lot of the water historically had been diverted from from where it naturally was flowing to the front range of Colorado, which is where you're sitting today. So it's literally true that the communities from Fort Collins to Denver to Pueblo really wouldn't have existed without the diversion of that water. And people on the Western Slope for many, many generations have said quite reasonably, remind us why we're diverting water from our communities to the front range. That's been a challenge and it's been one of the fundamental things as a state that we've had to wrestle with, it has become much more challenging in the era of climate change. We are in a 1,200 year drought now in the Colorado River Basin. This is the beginning of that basin, but that, that the basin serves 40 million people over the, uh, its travels from here. Uh, it used to be to the Gulf of Mexico, now it almost makes it to the Gulf of Mexico, and we're going to have to deal with this. You know, the quality of life in Colorado has changed over the last 20 years, and people know it. Farmers and ranchers know that there's less moisture available for their, far for their farms and for their ranchers. We have dealt with devastating fire fires, wildfires, all across our state. Wildfires are no longer, people say, no longer a fire season, but they are perennial, they are all year long, and people are having to adjust as a result of that. If you talk to the ski resorts in our state, they'll tell you it's become harder to get insurance because of concerns about uh, those fires and concerns about a lack of water. And if you just spend any time traveling our state or living in our state, uh, you know that <clears throat> the, the constant challenge of fire and of mudslides uh, and of smoke uh, uh, are not what we all signed up for. That's not why we live here and that's not why people have, have moved here. Uh, so I think it's become incredibly important for us to deal with climate uh, as the urgent problem that it is. We don't think of it here mostly as something that's gonna affect people 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, but it will. But it is affecting people here today. And the next generations of Coloradans have lost all patience with my generation of Coloradans, including my kids, because of our inability to, to do anything about this. I, I am I'm not going to go on for very long, but I am never, or I, I, I often, um, when I'm given a speech to read on the floor of the Senate, and people put the word, my staff puts the word proud in the speech, I always strike it out because I think it sounds like you're a politician. We say, I'm proud of this, I'm proud of that. And I try to avoid doing that because I wasn't a politician before I was in this job. But uh, I did have an occasion to call Caroline Bennett, the young woman who's in New Delhi right now, uh, uh, who was overseas at the time, to tell her that uh, we had passed something called the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States Congress and that President Biden had signed it. 
And that was the most significant piece of climate legislation that any, to this date still, that any government on the face of the earth has passed. And it passed in the United States Congress last year after years and years and years of delay and years and years and years of de depression. I was deeply distressed before I called Caroline, two weeks before we passed the bill, because Joe Manchin, my colleague from West Virginia, had walked away from the legislation and I thought it would be another 20 years or another 25 years. But here I was on the phone with Caroline Bennett being able to say that I was actually proud that we had passed that piece of legislation. I was. And she amazingly, remarkably, I think, was actually proud of her father's contribution to the bill, which I also was grateful for. And it is already making, as you'll hear from my colleague here is representing the solar industry, it has made enormous difference in our state. You know, we've had people working in solar, we've had people working in wind, we've had people working and thinking about how carbon sequestration would work. Now we have a significant uh, economic set of incentives in place because, as a result of that bill that I think is going to put Colorado in the position to lead. But I also believe the United States now really is, and I know this will be of interest to many of you that have spent time abroad, really is in the, in the position to lead the entire world in the transition we have to make. Not just because of that bill, but because of other assets that we have, because of the abundant fossil fuels that we have that other communities around the world don't have. That may sound strange that I said that. I'm happy to take questions on it. Because of our commitment to the rule of law, because relatively speaking, we have less corruption than a lot of other places, because of the innovation that exists in the United States, because of the bill that we passed, you add all of that stuff together, and I think we are in an opportunity, really, to lead this transition. I think we are in an opportunity, really, to replace Chinese coal all around the world, which would be a benefit to humanity. I think we are in the position to replace Russia's natural gas to Europe, which is uh, an important boost that our allies in Europe need to keep them in this fight against Ukraine. So all of these things are tied together and for a moment I think we can have maybe say to the next generation of Americans and to the next generation coming after us around the globe that we've actually for once done something a little bit useful for your future. Now we have to build on it. We have to build on it. And as our counselor from AID will tell you, there are many, many places around the world, places you have served, places people have been in this room where uh, this transition to cleaner energy just looks completely unaffordable. And that's another role that the United States, I think, can play because we are a wealthy enough country to develop these technologies here in the United States. And, and hopefully by the time this transition is really taking off over the next decade, and certainly over the next quarter century, this country will be exporting technologies at a price point that is low enough for them to be adopted in countries all over the world that can lead humanity you know, into, a, into a sustainable future. So uh, you're catching me on an optimistic morning here in Denver, Colorado, but thank you for coming here and I look forward to your questions. I'm happy, by the way, to take questions on this topic or anything else you might want to talk about. I'm very happy not to be a member of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Bennett. Um, next, we have Mike Kruger, who has served as president and CEO of the Colorado Solar Storage Association since October 2018. Um, he also has had a long history before then of being in D.C. where he was the director of the communications for the Smart Electric Power Alliance and also um, uh, at the Department of Commerce under the Obama administration. When he's not uh, explaining the wonders of the electric grid, you can find him watching baseball. So, fun fact. Uh, 
Thank you very much. At the risk of sounding like a politician, I'm incredibly proud to be up here sharing the stage with these <laughs> folks. Um, certainly a, a highlight of my week, uh, for sure, to be in front of all y'all. Um, good morning, I'm Mike Kruger. As was said, I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado Solar and Storage Association, and we represent nearly 300 businesses, almost 10,000 individuals, up 20% since last year, by the way, thank you very much, uh, who will install solar panels or batteries across Colorado. And I've been in my role for five years. I came from DC, as you heard. I may have given up on DC ever doing anything. I might have been more related to your daughter than, uh, uh, or felt that way anyway. Uh, and I came here, I was gonna save this beautiful square state. I'm smart, I knew everything, and I was gonna do the best that I could to at least save the one part of the country that I thought was so beautiful. So I've traveled all over Colorado. And I stand here today to suggest the top three policy prescriptions to decarbonize Colorado Mountain West, or the entire world. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I could, but I could also give you guys 15 minutes and a bunch of post-it notes and you'd have better solutions than I would. The truth is no one cares. That's what I learned. They don't care that you're smart. They don't care that you're a Fulbrighter. They aren't interested in your plans to save the world. Because when they hear save the world, they actually hear change the world. And Everyone hates change. Very few people get up in the morning to destroy the world, and there are a few. Those of you that work in national security, God bless you. But for everybody else, they get up to do a job. In the energy space, it might be an accountant for a midstream gas company, a mechanic at the coal mine, or an executive for an oil refinery. And they firmly believe that they are powering our world to enable us to turn our lights on whenever we want, to have breakfast in San Francisco and lunch in Denver and to stay warm when it's cold and cold when it's warm. So when you come to tell them that you're, that, uh, you, when you come along to tell them that the world has to decarbonize for reasons, what they hear is you want to put them out of a job. And my experience is this, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Empathy is the single best policy driver known to man. Maybe like me, you grew up with privilege. You didn't know a single blue collar worker Everyone in your world had a bachelor's and, and family gatherings that were a smattering of PhDs, just for fun. I would implore you to go leave that world. Go into the communities and listen, really listen. And I know you do as Fulbrighters, but do it again. Don't get stuck in your ivory tower. Don't get stuck in your Washington, D.C. policy worlds. Do it over and over. Don't just write about a just transition. Go understand what it's like to live in communities that are in transition. What a giant disruption it will be to individual lives. How it calls into question much of the assumptions they built their whole lives on. Oh yeah, go work in the mine, they said. Coal powers America. Oh, take that accounting job with the refinery. We're gonna need that forever. Uh, the refinery always needs mechanics. Those are good jobs. You'll never have to find another one in your life. Internalize how community identities will have to fundamentally change. Decarbonize has a very different meaning in Carbon County, Wyoming. I implore you to go listen, and then take your amazing genius and write the best damn policy prescriptions you can. We can save the world, in fact, we must save the world, but it only happens when everyone knows that we are changing the world so that everyone's lives are better. Thank you for your time, and looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you all. You have given us a lot of food for thought, and there are a lot of ways um, that, that we could take this conversation. Um, we're going to spend about 10 minutes talking up here, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So I hope you're, you're thinking about some great questions for these amazing panelists. Um, just to, to, to get us started, I am more bullish today on our future and our ability to kind of come up with some answers and solutions to some of these big problems. Um, in, in part from my perspective, um, companies are seeing it as in their interest to be more sustainable, to try and drive better engagement with their communities and, and to um, think about their position in the world of water usage and, and how they can think about that. I think there is a lot of 
capital that wants to be deployed in a responsible way. And I think with the IRA, we also are finally getting public policy into alignment to help incentivize all of those things that are, that are going in the right direction. Um, would love to hear from you all, kind of what gives you cause for optimism? Where, where do you see kind of the, the shining lights? And then, and then we'll get into um, what gives you pause, but <laughs> let's start off on a positive note. <laughs> There's more solar on the grid today than there was yesterday, which is more than last week, which is more than last year, which is more than the year before. So every day, everywhere around the world, we can talk about China's coal, but they're also installing massive amounts of wind and solar. And people are doing it. We tried for about 20 years to shame them. We put a polar bear on a little ice float and sent them on their way and said, stop doing that. And then we made it in their economic best interest. It turns out people like getting rich and saving the world. We made doing the right thing the easy thing, and there's a lot more work to be done. And I'm only in the energy sector. I don't know how we feed the world. That seems to me intractable, and so I'm so glad I'm, we have great folks working on that. But that's what gives me excitement, is that every day we are incrementally making it better than it was yesterday. I guess I would just repeat, yeah, I said I was optimistic, and, 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 and I am, in part because the incentives that are in the Inflation Reduction Act are actually 10 years long. And, you know, most of the stuff in Washington these days, you're lucky if the policy lasts for six months. You're lucky if it, if it lasts for one administration. And that matters a lot. You know, if you're somebody who's opposed to making these changes, the rubble that is in our democratic institutions really suits your purposes very well because you're not trying to sustain change. You're not trying to make change over the course of generations. And I would say I don't think we can do banking policy or food policy, you know, two years at a time. But you certainly can't do climate policy. This is generational stuff. And I think 10 years actually begins to approach the, that. On the other hand, let me say, I didn't say this earlier, we were one vote away from failing to pass this bill, you know, and in the end, an occasion I'm happy to describe if anybody's interested, I ended up having to spend time on Joe Manchin's boat in the Potomac River, and <laughs> we were able to get that vote and get some other things that we had to get done as part of this that it that made, but it shows how close we came to not achieving what we, what we need, and I will save the discussion of dysfunction for what I'm worried about. And, and just on that, um, the, the exciting thing that I see is that paved the way for what Canada is, has just proposed recently among their clean energy legislation and trying to incentivize um, renewables and, and some of the newer technology around hydrogen and, and carbon capture and um, kind of the, the broader energy transition. And so I, I, that's, I'm excited for that. The U.S. did something right in, in showing showing the way, and I'm hoping other countries will will follow. But um, you know, it's, I think if not for the IRA, Canada would not be where it is at the moment on that. So, what gives me hope and the optimism is how the general public, how our community has stepped up to support food banks that provide, and the majority of food pantries that are all in your you know, your neighborhood church and synagogue operate, most of their food comes from a Feeding America food bank. And now people have recognized the need and the importance of nutritious food and the decrease in the stigma that exists amongst people who are, who are experiencing food insecurity to accessing help. And the fact that financial contributions has sustained our operations what gives me concern is the sustainability of our business model as a food bank. With right now just 13% of our food coming from the USDA, unless we see a doubling or a tripling, it is challenging. I was just talking with one of the nation's largest Feeding America food banks that reduced their food purchasing by 25% this year, and they're laying off staff because that outpouring of support that we saw in the height of COVID hasn't maintained. We fortunately are not in that position at Food Bank of the Rockies, yet we are concerned about the sustainability without great increase is in TFAP, which is the Emergency Food Assistance Program and the Farm Bill.
And I, I <clears throat> would say that what gives me hope and optimism is having spent 21 years in the Foreign Service, but living in places overseas like Senegal or Ghana or in Pakistan, uh, working on, on Libya, um, and just coming also from the Caribbean. Um, it's, you know, for me, it's actually been the engagement that you have with the people there, the local people, the beneficiaries, and hearing their stories, and hearing from them what the work that you've done actually, one, maybe save their community, but when you have a young person or, 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 or a family person come up to you and say, the work that you did on this humanitarian effort, or the work that you're doing in our community saved my life, you know, there's nothing better to hear to continue to motivate you to be passionate about what you're doing. And it goes back to what Mark was saying earlier, you know, when it comes to empathy, but it's even, you know, you take it up a little higher than that. It really comes down to human dignity and how we value ourselves and how we value others around us. And so when I hear about programs like our Feed the Future program that has lasted for years and, and across administrations, where we're actually helping local farmers improve their crop or improve their livelihoods, which means their community and, and, and that country's livelihood is improving. Before I came here, I was in, in the state of Illinois, and I have to say, I know this is on tape, I love uh, Colorado uh, more so than I did in the state of Illinois. Um, but, um, but I did go down to one of our universities there, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign area, where we have a food, Feed the Future Lab on soybean value chain. And what was interesting in hearing about that is what we're doing in Africa with local farmers to improve that crop yield because there is this um, incident called rust. And once you see this rust on the, on, the, on the crop, basically that whole crop is gone for the year. But now we're providing you know, AI, uh, we're providing better tools, climate smart technology for these farmers that are being you know, realized and researched here in the States, but working with their local researchers that now have improved that yield and have now changed the life of these farmers. And so, for example, in one country, you know, over 200 farmers are now making a profit off of what they were doing with the soybeans. And they're also introducing new types and varieties of soybean so that these crops can actually continue to grow. But then the other piece of it is also learning that you know, thousands and thousands of youth were actually employed during, in these communities. And, and as we know, there's so much going on with our youth these days, and you know, there's such a youth bulge internationally, but to be able to know that now we're providing a productive life for them and keeping them out of, of themselves getting in trouble, but also having a livelihood that now they can also contribute to their communities. You know, it doesn't really get any better than that. I am. Um... I love that, that touching on, on youth, because it, as I think about the attendees in our audience, many are um, working on college campuses today or are educators. We even have some K through 12 educators that I met earlier today. Um, and, and it gives me a lot of optimism. You know, I, I love that your daughter and the, and the young citizens of, of Colorado are really pushing you and, and your colleagues and everyone to do something and, and, and not, um, they're not satisfied with the, with the status quo and kind of where they see the trajectory going. I love that. And, and so as you think about, you know, so we have folks who are part of universities, colleges, education, they are part of their, you know, communities, other nonprofit organizations that they're a part of. So we touch a lot of people in, in different ways. Um, what would you, what are some suggestions that you think you could give these, these folks, either to messages to take back to those, um, those constituencies or um, activities that we can all be doing um, as you think about what we've been talking about. And anyone can go. I'd be happy to start. So Food Bank of the Rockies operates pantries, or I should say provides food for pantries in a couple of dozen higher ed or K-12 institutions, just recognizing and rates of food insecurity for kids overall are higher than that for adults, 
both in Colorado and across the country. We especially see that on college campuses. It's been such a hidden issue, as well as kids in school. We're also providing food for kids to take home over the weekend for about 5,000 kids a week right now. And so I think just recognizing that and the essential building block that food provides for any kid to have educational attainment, that that should be solution number one. And when someone's not experienced or in a position to solve for that is to get involved by volunteering or making financial gifts to make it possible for those for whom they can't thrive in life because they don't have that building block. That's so true. I, I think we don't think about that food insecurity on campus, but it, it is very real. And so we need to be addressing that and thinking about that for our, for our students. I would say for, you know, there are a lot of young people in our country who are discouraged about the course of events and are worried that we're leaving them in the lurch. And there can be a tendency to, for people to turn their back and to say, this system is just corrupt and therefore I'm going to turn my back. And I hear people say that all the time, young people say that. I think it's very important for people to to say to them, not that they're wrong, because there are many ways in which the system is corrupt, but that we need them now more than we've ever needed them before, that the entire future of our country depends on their willingness to overcome the, all the reasons why they shouldn't participate and make a contribution and get them to, to make that contribution, because the amount of work we have to do is extraordinary. I mean, it is, every time I see her and I ask her, how are things going at the Food Bank of the Rockies? Are you seeing more people or fewer people? And we've known each other long enough for me to know the answer is always going to be more people. You know, whether the economy is going up or the economy is going down. That's a reflection of 50 years of an American economy that's worked really well for the people at the very top and has not worked well for anybody else. How are we going to create a, an economy in this country then when it grows, it grows for everybody, not just for the people at the very top. You know that students going to college at the University of Colorado don't have to take time out of their day to go to the food bank of the Rockies because they can't feed themselves. You know, or or Indian or Native American people living in Colorado who are facing less water predictability than Aunt Rose was facing 50 years ago in the southern part of the United States. You know, we've got an immigration system right now that's so broken that, uh, that, that it's a headwind for the United States. We've got a health care system so broken. Our K-12 system, I used to be the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools here, is, is reinforcing the income inequality we have rather than liberating people from those circumstances. As a general matter, that's absolutely true. I mean, the list is long of stuff that needs to get done. But I think it's really important for those of you that know the history of this country and know the history of democracy to say to young people how hard it is just to get where we've gotten. That's not an excuse. It's true. And, you know, my favorite example is Frederick Douglass, which I'll spare you with today. But as somebody born a slave in the United States of America, taught himself to read, and then went to Massachusetts and and, and encountered the abolitionists for the first time and said, tell me what you're arguing. And they told him, well, we're arguing that the Constitution of the United States was a pro-slavery document. And he said to them, again, totally self-taught, he said, that's completely the wrong argument. You should be making an argument that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document, but we're not living up to the words of the Constitution. It's not hard to imagine what the power of that different way of thinking about it meant. And he affected the abolition movement in a very fundamental way. And because of him and other things, obviously, we ended slavery in the United States. You know, I think of him as a founder as much as anybody who wrote the Declaration of Independence or wrote the Constitution. That's not rhetorical for me or sounding like a politician. I actually happen to believe that's true. You know, I think the women who fought 100 years in America for the self-evident right to vote, most of whom died without anybody here ever knowing what their name was going to be, without anyone here ever, without them ever actually seeing women get the right to vote, 
<clears throat> that those people too are founders of this country, just like the people who wrote the Constitution. And that's the standard of citizenship we should be asking for, demanding, out of the next generation of Americans. And the more corrupt they think it is, as long as there are people in this country and around the world whose vote is being taken away from them, they have no right to say it's too corrupt for them to show up and to organize people and mobilize people and get people to vote and make the change, even if that means voting me out or any of the rest of these people out. But I would say that's the thing that I, you know, am most worried about is making sure that, that we, we have engaged this next generation because if we don't, uh, we're going to be the last generation to, I think, enjoy the, the blessings of this democracy. I really believe that. I don't like going after him. <laughs> here's, here's what I, I go speak to a couple MBA classes a year about the future of, of renewables in Colorado, uh, and I tell every single one of them to become an electrician, which they uh, don't like to hear because they're well in debt at that point. Um, but we are fundamentally switching our economy, our worldwide economy, from molecule-based to electron-based. Yeah. And the real heroes are going to be the men and women who build that, who put in the EV charger that you don't know who their names are, right? But they've done the good work that we've asked of them from a public policy perspective so that you can plug your EV in and so that you lower your carbon emissions. They're the folks who will be out in some godforsaken windswept prairie installing 1,000-acre solar facilities so that you can turn your lights on, you can watch your Netflix, and you can have your nice microwave popcorn. So become an electrician. I'm not kidding. They make 150 bucks an hour. That's what I would tell folks. I also think we need to destigmatize the trades, right? We all, <laughs> we all might be to blame for that. Most of us have a lot of letters after our names. And we should. We should be proud of that, right? Maybe not politically proud, but proud nonetheless. But we've got to be able to say to young men and women, hey, I need somebody who can be an HVAC expert, right? I need somebody who can be an electrician. I need somebody who can sling panels. I don't know if you've ever lifted a panel. I cannot lift panels. In fact, I don't actually know how solar works. It's kind of magic. I know how politics work and how policy works. Solar magic. But we need those folks, and we need to figure out how to destigmatize that. That you're not a failure because you went to the trades. You're a frontline climate worker, right? Can we do that kind of thing? So I go tell these MBA kids or young adults to go become an electrician. They immediately tune me out because they want to go to Wall Street and make a lot of money. And we need people at Wall Street making a lot of money. But we need folks on roofs, in fields, you know, building the future that is going to be electron-based, not fossil fuel-based. So that's what I would tell folks. Um. And, and just on that point, I was earlier this week in D.C. listening to um, Mark Ganzi, who um, is, is helping to drive a lot of the communications infrastructure, so between cell towers and data centers and fiber rollout. There are a lot of workers that we need who can do that work that is fulfilling work, that's well paid, and, and, and so how can we help encourage that broader view of trades, um, and it just as, as we think about how our economy is changing and how some of those really strong jobs will no longer be in the future, and so we need to replace them. And there, today, there are already a lot of wonderful options for people, but we need to support the education for them to, to move into that space. Um, I would love to uh, open up for a couple of questions. Munir is um, going to be running the mic. There he is. Oh, already got the first question. Great, thank you. This on? Oh, thank you. Couple points. First of all, spend time in a community college. As someone who has taught in a community college, those are where the electricians on. But we don't have community colleges represented in the Fulbright community. And that's something we need to work harder on to get community college faculty here to advance the trades. Second thing, as a, as a son of Maryland, uh, Frederick Douglass is something we are proud of in the state of Maryland more than anything else. So thank you, Senator Bennett. 
The last thing I would say, what preceded this conference was a youth summit that took place yesterday where we had 100 students here from area high schools and colleges in Denver, and we talked to them about things that they could be doing, projects that they could be developing, uh, things to work to eradicate homelessness, which is an issue in Colorado and Denver like it is in many parts of the country. But greater issues such as trafficking and things of that nature, and the students came up with their own ideas of what they can do. Yes, the answer is with the next generation, Yes, as Senator Bennett said, we've messed it up quite a bit, and we need to fix what we can, but they have the answers, and we need to turn to them, not thinking that it's all something that we know, but they're closer to it than we are. So go to the youth, look to them, engage them. Thank you. Councillor White. I'm sorry, what was your name again, sir? David Smith. David Smith. Okay. You're not going anywhere, are you? No, I'm not. I'm just going to sit over there. Okay. All right. Because I wanted to respond to that because I agree with you. And one of the things that I had done when I was in the Caribbean in Barbados, which is why it's so important to involve the youth and also ensuring that women are also being represented at the table, whether it's um, young women, older women. I mean, it's, you know, we really do have to be more inclusive in all that we're doing. And one of the things that I said is that when we started our new strategy, I wanted to create a youth advisory group. Um, so I covered 11 countries in the Caribbean. You know, please don't think that I was just uh, traveling. But you know, we were doing a lot of hard work there. But I wanted to get at least one youth from each of the countries, as well as other representation from other underserved or underrepresented groups. And that group actually, when we formed that group, now they've sort of became our advisors to new programs and activities that we were actually designing. We wanted their voice as part of that because we wanted not only for this work to be sustainable, but we know that this is the next generation. And if we're not working with them, and if they're not seated at the table and using their voice at the table, then we're not actually gonna be able to achieve the goals that we set ourselves up for. And so when we created that actual group, you know, we brought them into Barbados you know, from all the various countries. And it was just so nice to be able to hear their perspectives on things and we sort of broke them out into different areas, whether it's climate change, disaster management, um, women's empowerment, water security. And so now they have become, you know, part of our mission uh, going forward, even though I've left. You know, they do a two-year term and then they rotate out and we get, uh, you know, more youth. But one of the other things about it, which was I thought was so important, because we see what's happening with our youth overseas, here in the States, you know, the, the rise of youth on youth crime and violence and, and gun violence is on the rise. And, um, you know, these kids, you know, are they valuing themselves? Are they valuing others? You know, who are they trying to be? How is it that we can help them to better achieve something? So one of the youth that we actually, which I asked is um, for, was one gentleman who was going through one of our juvenile justice reform programs in St. Lucia. And I said, you know, let's make sure that he's also part of this group. And so we had to speak with the, the government of St. Lucia to the detention center, not only for him just to be part of it, but I wanted him to be able to travel wherever these people were going. And so we were able to uh, um, get permission for him to travel. So when he came to Barbados and was seated among his peers, nobody ran away from him thinking, you know, this is a bad person. They all celebrated, embraced him just as I did, just as everyone did, and knowing that his voice counted just as much as anybody else's. And I just say that as when we think about you know, these challenges and these problems, and they are hard, that when we can involve the youth in getting them engaged, we can actually do much better in solving these. And then they become part of the solution with us as well. And the other point I just wanted to make, and, and I hope I'm not speaking too long, but the community college aspect of it, that is something that at USAID, we are now uh, intentionally going out and meeting with various community colleges. Matter of fact, as I said, I just came from the great state of Illinois, you know, it's a nice state. Um, we met with the community colleges there. We had a meeting with all of the city community colleges at Olive Henry uh, School, and now we're actually creating a hub so that we can get their voices into the things that we're doing. We're building bridges with the countries that we're working in with community colleges. And you know, we, we're now looking at internships, we're looking at careers, career fairs, but that's not where we're stopping. I'm supposed to be speaking next year at the International Development for Community Colleges, which is about 80 plus community colleges. 
I'm going to California and meeting at, um, with the community colleges there in Los Angeles and Oakland. So you're right, you know, we need to create this opportunity in getting the community colleges involved because they do offer a lot of what we're doing and it makes sure that we're being more inclusive in including those voices that may not have always been at the table but need to be. Um, Leland? First of all, thank you so much for the, the time and the incredible conversation. My name is Leland Lazarus. I'm from Florida International University. Uh, I was surprised to know that the weather here was actually quite similar to Miami. Uh, it's probably the only similarity between our states. So, um, you know, I wanted to ask a question about um, U.S.-China cooperation when it comes to climate. Um, obviously, we're in the era of strategic competition, but what I'm thinking in terms of food security to development challenges to financing solar energy, I mean, China is a necessary partner in dealing with that, right? You've got uh, companies like BYD, who's a leader in electric vehicles. Uh, you have farmer, U.S. farmers who rely on the Chinese market to, for its exports. And then, of course, this year is the 10th anniversary of the China's Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, it's caused a lot of corruption, a lot of uh, debt trap diplomacy, but it's also financed quite a bit of climate um, projects around the world. And so my question to each of you is, um, how do you foresee potential U.S.-China cooperation in your various fields? Are you seeing that, or are you seeing sort of further fragmentation? Uh, and if there is further fragmentation, how can we get to an area of collaboration? I'm happy to, I'm happy to let you start. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I thank you for your question. I think, first of all, that, um, the American people, I think, have concluded that we've been telling ourselves a story about what China's, China's entry into the WTO and what Ch China's entry into kind of the global economy would mean for America that turns out not to have been true for the last 50 years. So w when I went to college and law school, it was common just for people to think, this is just the nature of capitalism, this is the nature of free trade, everything's going to sort of work out. and. I think from the vantage point of the, of the U.S., what we are realizing is that we have been competing not on sort of a level playing field, but we've been competing with a version of state-sponsored capitalism on the part of the Chinese that's been really good for China, China, but not so good for us economically. And as much as I, you know, Donald Trump drives me crazy, that's not, that's a personal observation, not a political observation. Uh, I do think he had a preternatural sense about this when he was running for president, you know, and he called the question on this in ways that nobody else, you know, had done. So now the question becomes, what do we do about that? And I'm not going to go through all the things that I said earlier that we should fix if all we cared about was America, but if all we cared about was our competition with China, we'd want to fix those same things too. And that's, there's nothing Beijing can do about any of that stuff. That has to do with how we want to approach the next generation of Americans. You know, and so, so I think there's that category of things. Then I think there's a category of, of things that I sort of think of as standing up for democracy in the face of Xi Jinping's very different view of the world. I'll give you an example. Do we want artificial intelligence to evolve on planet Earth in a way that sh sh serves Xi Jinping's surveillance state and totalitarian approach to governing? Or do we want it to evolve in a way that's consistent with our civil liberties, consistent with our civil rights, consistent with our values? That's something that's at stake right now because the United States is not leading on the standard setting around the world because of the dysfunction in Congress on this issue. On climate, I, or on, 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 on China also, I, I had a young person in my office recently and I asked her, why is it that there are not protests all over America on college campuses about what the Chinese, what, not the Chinese, but what Beijing is doing to the Uyghurs. Why, why is there not human rights protests all over America 
because of what Beijing is. And she had a fascinating answer, which goes to your question, which was, she said, you know what? Part of it is we're worried because we think we can't solve the climate crisis without Beijing, without China. And we have to make sure they're not our enemy. And she said that's one of the reasons why you don't see those kind of protests. I don't know whether that's true or not. I thought that was a fascinating data point because it goes exactly to what your question is, which is we should not be in a war with China. We should not be, you know, imagining that that's going to be good for humanity. We should not be, you know, spending our time rattling our swords in ways that are unhelpful. I do think it's very important for us to stand up for democracy and for human rights. That means it's going to be very important for the United States to be able to say that we in, we're practicing what we preach. You know, that we have an economy that actually works, that we're feeding people with an economy that actually works, that we're ending childhood poverty in our country, for example. Those are things, again, Beijing can't do. And where we can cooperate, we are going to have to and we need to. And climate, I think, is the most obvious place. That young person, I think, was exactly right. And I think you're exactly right. We, as we go forward, you know, on proceeding on a, on a path that's more strategic for ourselves, we have to do it in a way that allows us to engage Beijing in a way that's constructive. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry for going on for so long, but it is, it just captures, I think, so well, not me, but your question, captures so well the nuances that need to exist in our political debates that we now don't hear on the cable television at night. So I would encourage you to turn off the cable television and spend your time with the next generation of Americans having the kind of conversation you guys are having today. I appreciate it. So this is gonna to have to be the last question, unfortunately, but. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Andy DeWald from Germany. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. I have a question uh, for you, Senator Bennett, in terms of um, lobbyism and water security. If we see big companies like Nestle buying up water. I'm sorry, I missed the first word. You said Nestle. The question in, terms of in terms of water security yes. and uh, how can we ensure that we have a lot of lobbyism around capital companies like Nestle and other subsidiaries that are, for example, buying up water and the lobby for nature almost does not exist, but we have the necessity to protect nature, not only in terms of water. So I just wanted to, to ask you, how do you see lawmakers and maybe also in Washington DC, what needs to change to amplify the voice of nature over capitalistic interests from lobbies and companies? Well, I, I think that too is a great, great question. Um, there are parts of our lives and our societies that I think we have finally concluded markets don't measure very well, you know, and markets don't necessarily distribute stuff very well. We, we told ourselves for a long time, here in the U.S. anyway, that markets and sort of privileging the shareholder over lots of other interests was going to somehow lead us to a much more, a much better organized set of priorities in our economy and other kinds of things. I don't think that's the broadly shared view anymore about our economy, to say nothing of water, which, you know, in Colorado, you know, we are governed by a very elaborate set of water laws that, um, that, are, that are sometimes very challenging, but they force us, I think, in the end to make sure that what we're doing is in the public interest. And every now and then, there is somebody who shows up who says they want, they have an idea for, for uh, putting water rights in Colorado to the use of some private interest. And our, our general reaction to that as a state has been to push back against that. I think more broadly and more globally, we, we need to have a, an agenda around sustainability. That's something that legislators, not just in the US and Germany, but all over the world, many of the countries that Clinton is dealing with too, can get behind, and I think as we think about that, we need to, and I'll stop here, but we need to think very carefully about uh, what Mike said in, in the beginning here about the, um, the language that we use and the discussion that we have, because a lot of the language we use is, tend to be repellent to the people that we're trying to attract to the policy positions 
that we have for the reasons that he said. And I think we'd be a lot better off when it comes to sustainability to be having a conversation with people that's actually rooted in their reality rather than our assumption of what their reality is, which are two completely different things most of the time. Um, we're going to take one more question. Um, I think there was someone here in the, yes, right there, right here, Munir. Thanks very much. Um, one of my favorite issues as an ethics professor is the fact that human rights really has to do with the basic fundamental of treating people with respect. Giving them water, food, housing is a basic way to be respectful. You want me to stand up? <laughs> So what I want to do is to offer a question by way of a suggestion, and that is, what if we approach the Fulbright program and ask them to set up some joint scholarships that would focus on a priority for sustainability, water, food, and climate change? We could hook with, link up with AID, AID, and we could do a joint scholarship where you could have a scholar go and work with you and then have students follow up. There's a clear link between our elected officials, the State Department, which funds Fulbright, and then the Fulbright program. We could really push for a priority on some of these issues, and then the rest of us could follow with projects that would offer those by way of expertise. And as, as a Fulbright scholar, a student, or a specialist, we could develop those with continuation. So you're going in year after year after year. And just as on a sort of a more personal passion of mine, it's also local. I've been made very aware recently that our native population in the Navajo Nation, the largest in the US, 250,000 people, 40% do not have water. It's not that they don't have good water, they don't have water. So maybe we could trial some projects in the US that would address these, and then we could take them abroad, because right now it is so tumultuous. I was supposed to go to Jordan. It's not going to happen. So we could begin to follow up and, and build from those. So. Oh, I will thank stop Thank you here. so thank much. Thank you so yes. much. Well, let's, those are some great ideas. So let's follow the, the conversation um, up after this. I wanted to just say thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Really appreciate it. And um, let's continue the conversations.